In Brother Ken's prayer just a moment ago, he may mention of what has transpired out in California. And folks, we have a real crisis that is arising throughout the world and has been for a long, long time. They refer to themselves as ISIS, ISIL, and just by the letters IS. The next two Sunday nights, I want to teach two classes about Islam. One of them is the Caliphate, and the other one will deal with the Muslim view of end times. And when you hear these two lessons, some of the questions that we have, especially maybe with our present administration, might be answered just a little bit better. So I hope you'll make plans to be back, and we'll talk about uh, some of these issues that are going on in our world at this present time. The title of our lesson is Already Above Me. It is all about Christ. If you are taking notes, all I can say is this. Have fun. We have a lot of information that we're going to be covering. We could probably present this lesson in about six lessons, and we're going to try to cover it in one lesson this morning. So we've got a lot to do. So some of the things that we'll do, we'll just fly through. You're going to see several lists. If you're taking notes, just write down one verse. Don't try to write down all the verses, because if you do, you will be frustrated and mad at me at the end of the service, and I don't need that. So... Uh, do your best and we'll get through this. It's all about Christ, folks. From beginning to end, it's all about Christ. And guess what? It always has been, has it not? Folks, Jesus Christ is the eternal plan of the Almighty God. In Ephesians, the Apostle Paul talks about the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He notes that the church is the eternal plan of God, but... Without Jesus Christ, the church could never have been founded. Thus the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 3 verse 11, According to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our Lord looked down the quarters of time and He could see that man would sin. He could see that man would fall and therefore He purposed to send His Son, Jesus Christ, to die upon the cross of Calvary for the forgiveness of man's sins. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world and is manifest in these last times for you. Again, notice, Jesus was planned in the mind and heart of God long before man was ever created and placed upon the earth. Jesus is the eternal plan of God. Point number two. Jesus Christ is the theme of the entire Bible. When I'm teaching my how to study the Bible lessons, we talk about themes of the Bible and themes of books of the Bible. And a theme is very simply the golden thread that runs through a book or the entirety of the Bible from start to finish. If there is a golden thread that ties every verse together in the Word of God, it is Jesus Christ the Son of the living God. Here's the theme of the Bible. The salvation or the redemption of fallen man by means of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There are many passages of Scripture that summarize and capture this particular thought within it. One of them is one that we're very familiar with. John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent His Son, why? To save mankind from their sins. There are two passages that I love when I talk about the theme of the Bible. One of them is 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. 
To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Folks, when we see Jesus, what we see is God in action, do we not? We see God carrying out His purpose on our behalf. We fall and we're in sin, we're in darkness, we're heading to eternal condemnation. And had it not been for the Almighty God sending His Son, we would have never been reconciled to God. How did He do it? Well, just two verses later. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He says, For He hath made Him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Folks, those are key verses to the entirety of the Word of God. God reconciling the world unto Himself. God sending Jesus and making Him to be sin for us so that we could be made righteous in Jesus Christ. So secondly, the theme of the Bible is all about Jesus. Here's something that's interesting. The Old Testament is all about Jesus, is it not? On one occasion, Jesus was standing before a group of Jews and He spoke these words. Search the Scripture. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of Me. This was during the life of our Lord. The New Testament had not been penned at this particular time. He's talking to Jews. And He tells those Jews, you need to go back, you need to pick up the Old Testament Scripture, and you need to search through those. Because those are the things that testify of me. Folks, when you study the Old Testament, you cannot but help see Jesus Christ throughout the Old Testament. And we find Him in a lot of different ways, do we not? We look at the sacrifices that were offered, those animal sacrifices, every one of them typical of Jesus Christ. We look also in the types and in the shadows and there's hundreds of them to be found in the Old Testament. And all of them again are pointing to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are over 300 messianic prophecies and every one of them are pointing to our Lord and Savior. When you study the Jews of the first century and even before the first century, you find out that they had what is referred to by some as the Jewish expectation. What we mean by that is this. The Jews knew that a Messiah had been prophesied. The Jews understood that there was a king that was supposed to come. The Jews realized that there was a prophet who had been foretold by Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and he was supposed to come to this world and redeem the Jews. And they were eagerly waiting for him. Let me give you a few illustrations of what we're talking about. Point number one, John the Baptist. John got taken and put in prison. While he was there, he had some doubts about the Son of God. So he sends disciples to Jesus. And do you remember the question that John asked? Art thou he that should come or do we wait for another? Matthew 11, verse 3. Folks, John manifests the Jewish expectation. Are you the one we've been waiting for? Are you the one who's supposed to come? Are you the Messiah? Or do we need to continue to wait? In John chapter 6 and verse 14, Jesus performs mighty miracles before the people. And as the people watch the wonders that Jesus did, they make this statement. Of a truth, this is the prophet that should come into the world. There was a man sitting in the temple when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to have all the rites of Judaism done upon him after his birth. I find it interesting how this man is described in Luke chapter 2 verse 25. It says this, He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Folks, he was waiting for the Savior. He was waiting for the Master. He was waiting for this King. He knew He was coming. It had been foretold. And this was the thought of all the Jews. The Jewish expectation. One reason that they were looking for a Messiah is because of a promise that had been made long, long ago 
to a man by the name of Abraham. Folks, as you read the life of Abraham, this promise about which we speak is made at least three times. That is, it is recorded for us at least three times in Scripture. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, the Bible says this, And in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now what's interesting about this seed is this, the singularity of the seed. Notice that God didn't tell Abraham, and in thy seeds, plural, all families of the earth be blessed. He said, in thy seed, singular, all families of the earth would be blessed. Every Jew understood it. Every Jew realized there is one and only one person for whom we are looking to come and bless Israel. And the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 3 verse 13 that that one person is, guess who? Jesus Christ. Now unto Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but unto thy seed, singular, now listen to what he says, which is Christ. Folks, in the Old Testament, When you read that seed promise, there is one and only one person that that promise belongs to, and that is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. So we have the sacrifices. We have the types and shadows. We have these messianic prophecies. And we have the Jewish expectation that this individual is coming, and guess who that individual is? It is none other than Jesus Christ. Search the Scriptures, for they are they which testify of me. The Old Testament Scriptures are all about Jesus. Let's talk for just a moment about the person of Christ. We open up our New Testaments and we begin to read, and what do we read about? We read about a person, do we not? And that person is none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In fact, the first four books revolve around this individual. The Bible wants us to understand that Jesus became a real human being. John 1 verse 14 is very clear about that, isn't it? And the Word, Jesus Christ, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2 verse 7 makes mention of the same thing, doesn't he? He says that Jesus made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Was Jesus a real man? Oh man, There's so many proofs of that that's just amazing. I've just listed ten of them. When Luke writes his gospel, he's writing to a Gentile, a man by the name of Theophilus. And the Gentiles were enamored with humanity. And they were on a search for something. They were looking for the wisest man. They were looking for the strongest man. They were looking for the most beautiful woman that they could possibly find. And that was in their thoughts constantly. And when Luke writes his gospel, guess what he says? Let me show to you the ideal man. And that is none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now here's what's interesting. Luke focuses upon the birth of Jesus more than any other writer. Why? Because if Jesus is really a human being, he had to have been born, did he not? And therefore he tells the story of Jesus' birth. All the promises that were given. How it was a birth that was a very unique, unusual birth. A virgin birth. A birth that involved the Almighty God himself. But yet, a birth of a real, live human being. We find other proofs, don't we? Jesus hungered. The Bible says that in Matthew chapter 4 in his temptation. Forty days and forty nights he fasted and afterward he was in hunger. When he sat there by Joseph's well, he grew thirsty, did he not? And he looked at that woman and what did he ask her? Give me to drink, he says. 
My friends, Jesus was a man who grew weary. He was a man oftentimes who was engaged in sleep. Remember one time he slept during the storm on the Sea of Galilee. He was an individual who could speak and did oftentimes. He was an individual who could touch and be touched by other individuals. He was an individual who had all kinds of emotions. The Bible talks about love. The Bible talks about sorrow. The Bible talks about His compassion. Jesus was a person who had real emotions like you and I do. He was a man who could bleed. And ultimately, He was a man who died. And my friends, it was His death that caused Him to become a perfect man. Had He never died, He'd have never experienced everything that humanity has to experience. And thus, he cries out on the cross of Calvary, Father, into thy hands I yield my spirit. And he gave up the ghost, a real man. There are individuals who believe that only the Bible really talks about the Son of God. They don't think that there's any true historical evidence that makes mention of Jesus Christ. And folks, that's just not the case. There is a lot of historical evidence wherein individuals make mention of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to give you just three examples very quickly. The first comes from a man by the name of Tacitus. He was a Roman historian and he writes the following. Nero fastened the guilt on a class hatred for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Now note this. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment again, broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Do you hear what he said? Listen to him again. Christus. He says, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate. Folks, here is a Roman historian. And he does not hesitate to let us know there was a real man by the name of Christus, Jesus Christ, who was crucified in the city of Jerusalem. Notice the next one. It comes from an individual by the name of Pliny the Younger. He was the governor of Bithynia in A.D. 112. He writes the following. They, talking about Christians, were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light. When they sang in alternative verses a hymn to who? Christ. As to a God. And bound themselves by a solemn oath. Not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery. Never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up. After which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble, to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. Folks, he's talking about the Lord's Supper. He's making mention of the fact that these Christians worshipped. And who do they worship? They worship Jesus Christ. Lastly, listen to what Josephus has to say. He was a Jewish historian who lived in the first century. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man. For indeed, one ought to call him a man. For he wrought surprising feats. He was the Christ. When Pilate condemned him to be crucified, those who had come to love him did not give up their affection for him. On the third day, he appeared, restored to life, and the tribe of Christians has not disappeared. Folks, those are powerful words written by historians, are they not? And the point that I'm trying to get across is this. Jesus Christ, who we read about in the pages of our Bibles, was a real human being. It is confirmed in Scripture, and it is confirmed also in secular history of that particular point in time. Jesus was a real person. And it's all about this man. Notice next. Jesus Christ is involved in almost all of the salvation elements, isn't he? Here's where we're just got to move through the things, folks. Point number one, Jesus Christ is tied to the grace of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, the Apostle Paul makes mention to the Corinthians that God had given to them grace by 
Jesus Christ. We can talk about the blood of Jesus Christ, and the passages are many, are they not? Revelation 1 verse 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus Christ is connected to his own death, is he not? And my friends, it is in that death that you or I are baptized into Romans 6 verses 3 and 4. The Bible talks about the cross of Christ. I find it interesting that crucifixion was a very prominent punishment doled out by the Roman government. There were hundreds. Well, no, there were thousands. No, there were tens of thousands of people who were crucified upon crosses. But today, when you and I make mention of the cross, every person knows what. I'm talking about the cross of the Son of the living God, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The New Testament is connected to Christ, is it not? We refer to also the law of Christ. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The Bible speaks of the gospel of Jesus Christ in Philippians 1 verse 27. We are baptized into Christ Jesus the Lord. And my friends, all of us are members of a church that Jesus purchased with His own blood and that church is the church of Christ. Romans 16 verse 16. Any salvation element that you want to talk about revolves around, is centered upon Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Notice the next point. Prepositions. I wish I had a lot of time to go into these prepositions. There are so many prepositions that are connected to Jesus Christ. Just look at a few of them. The Bible speaks of things being by Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 says that our salvation is by Christ. With Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 5. The Bible says that we have been perfected. That we have been raised up with Christ over and over again. Into Christ. Galatians 3 verse 27. Through Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57 says this. But thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And another one is for Christ. Philippians 3, verse 7. You could take every one of those prepositions and you can make an entire sermon. On one of these days, I'm going to take that through Christ and preach a lesson just on that one point alone because it's interesting. Point number seven, folks. The entirety of our lives involve Jesus Christ, don't they? Notice some of the points. You and I have believed in Christ, haven't we? The Philippian jailer after that earthquake and none of the prisoners escaped, entered into the cell of the Apostle Paul. He then brought them out and he asked them this question. Men and brethren, what must I do to be saved? And the answer rang clear then and rings clear now. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Every one of us in this audience who are Christians, members of the body of Christ, have our faith, our trust, our belief, our confidence in the Son of the living God. The one that you and I yield our obedience to is none other than Jesus Christ, is it not? Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. We've been saved by Christ. Acts 15, verse 11. We were baptized into Christ. Romans 6, 3 and 4. Galatians Chapter 3, verse 27. We follow Christ. What was it that Jesus says? Take your cross and what? Follow me. Matthew 16, verse 26. We speak for Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. We preach Christ. Acts 5, verse 42. We live for Christ. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1, verse 21. We serve Christ. Christ Jesus. Colossians 3, 24. And folks, watch this one. I love this. We win Christ. Philippians 3, verse 8. The Apostle Paul said, I count all things but dung that I may win Christ. Folks, that's our goal, is it not? That's our end result. To win Jesus Christ in the last day. Question. Who's involved in end time events? 
There's only one being, is it not? And it's Jesus Christ. Who are you waiting on right now to return from heaven? Folks, the Bible says that you and I right now are waiting upon Jesus Christ. When He comes back, we're going to stand before a judgment seat. And whose seat is that? The Bible says we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. The Bible also tells us that we're going to go and be with Christ. Philippians 1 verse 23. And lastly, that we'll have entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 11. I told you we were flying through this. Because see, we could be here for about two hours if we wanted to be. Here's what I'm trying to impress upon you folks. Everything in our religion is about Jesus. And we need to remember that. It's not about me. It's not about my opinions. It's not about my desires. It's not about my want-tos and my wishes. When you and I accept Christianity, it is a religion of Christ and everything points to is centered around and is focused on Him and Him alone. Paul makes an interesting statement that was read in our reading this morning, Colossians 3 verse 4. Listen to what he says. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with Him in glory. I want you to look at the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth word. Who is our life? Here's the question. Can we honestly say, Christ is my life? Is that how you live your life? When others see your life, is that what they see? Christ living in us? You see, it's all about Christ and no one else. Maybe you've not been saved by Christ today, and you need to be. The steps are simple and they involve Jesus, don't they? We hear the word of Christ. Romans 10 verse 17. It produces faith in Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10. We repent. What do we mean by that? We die to that old way of living so that we can what? Embrace the Christ and love Him more than the things that are in this world. We come forward and we confess the Christ before men. We're baptized into Christ, into His death. In order to receive that cleansing blood in our life so that we can be forgiven of all sin. And my friends, from that point on, it is our job, our duty, our responsibility, really our privilege, to live for Christ till the last day. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. We ask the question one more time. Can you honestly say, Christ is my life. Won't you come as together we stand and sit.